Okay, we are live on Facebook. Um, so, uh, Hisham, how are things in Morocco? Um, how's Hello. your work going? Um, any uh, things to report? Good things, bad things? Uh, well, uh, 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 we are always in in the quarantine, so I have been trying to to do uh, uh, the exercise you have uh, you have uh, sent me. Uh, uh, lately, I have been uh, I have. I have been trying to, to to stay away from the news about this coronavirus and, uh, and things. So it's uh, it's uh, one can take it as a little exercise, as a little willful exercise to stay away from this, this uh, the news. Uh, uh, so I'm trying to set a schedule and to go by it. Uh, also lately, uh, here in Morocco, as in other Islamic countries, uh, we are in the times of Ramadan. So uh, every, everyone is fasting uh, for uh, a whole uh, lunar, lunar month, which is called Ramadan. Uh, I am also partaking in it. So I, I, I also, I am fasting. So it started from yesterday. So uh, I mean, you fast during daylight hours. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. So you 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 have to eat before sunrise, and you can eat again after sunset. Yes, uh, you can eat until sunrise, and then yes, as you said it. Yeah, and uh, from what I understand, the the meal after sunset uh, is usually this big family type celebration meal, um, but you can't do that right now with uh, COVID-19. So it's just uh, you and your mother um, breaking the fast or? Yeah, uh, well, uh, normally this, this, this month, uh, uh, it is a, a cultural tradition that people gather around with the family to, to break the fast. And yes, uh, they cook these, these uh, tasty dishes uh, with sweet, sweet dishes or salty dishes. But uh, in these times, uh, this lu luxury is not is not permitted. We uh, we cannot uh, gather in uh, in, the, in eat together. Uh, a lot of people uh, uh, are not happy about it uh, because they have got used to uh, spending uh, this time, this month, in this specific way uh, with families and with big 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 feast to eat big uh, and, uh, and a lot of food. Maybe uh, uh, the food eaten during this, this month, it is, is usually more than it is eaten in the, in the, in the normal days. So maybe this is a, a time where, where people have no more these possibilities. Um, so uh, as I understand it, I mean, this is really interesting from a Gurdjieffian perspective that during the daylight hours, you're not allowed to eat or drink. Oh, here's my dog. <laughs> yes. Uh, so no liquids whatsoever. Um, yeah. I mean, I've done a seven day fast where I have not eaten any food for seven days. This is a while ago. Um, but I certainly kept up with my fluid intakes. Yours is a daylight hours fast. And during the daylight, you're not allowed to have anything go in through your mouth? Is that correct? Yes. No, um, no food. No, uh, no food. Uh, how for in Morocco? Um, so you're in North Africa. Um, you're still a little bit um, north of the equator, but um, how long are daylight hours? I, I know that, uh, for instance, when I lived in England twenty years ago, we had a Muslim family on the little close, the tiny little street that we lived on. And um, they loved Ramadan when it was in the middle of winter. They hated it in the middle of summer. Uh, where we lived in England at that point, in the middle of summer, it would start getting light around 4.30 and start in the morning and start getting dark mm -hmm. around 9.30, mm -hmm. 10 o'clock in the evening. And so the daylight hours were massive. In the winter, it was the reverse. 
in the winter, we would have darkness for about eight hours. That's, you know, it's a bit further north than where I am here in Toronto, where I lived in England. And uh, so they would have, uh, you know, during the winter, they loved it because they only had to fast for eight hours. In the summer, it was close to 16 hours mm. because it's on the lunar month and it, it flips around yeah. through the year. So it mm. moves through the seasons. Um, where, are, where you are now? Uh, so, uh, right, right now, uh, uh, the fasting is about uh, 14, 14 hours. So it starts start from 4 at the morning till, till, uh, till 7 at the, at the evening. Okay. And yes, uh, sometimes uh, these last years, Ramadan coincided with the, with the, with the summer. And you know, here in, uh, in Morocco especially, uh, in the summer, uh, uh, the temperatures are high. You can count for 40, 40 deg degrees Celsius, sometimes, sometimes uh, even more. Uh, and people fast for about 15, 15 hours because the day are longer. And then it also gets much hotter as well. So you would probably want to be yes. drinking more water, keeping more fluids. Um, so you can't be working outdoors and sweating and doing all of that. You've got to start conserving that liquid in you. Uh, well, uh, uh, yes, we can. We can. You can't drink. You don't. We don't drink in the in the course of the day. Yeah. Uh, but the, somehow it is uh, uh, personally. Uh, uh, it's not a problem. Much a problem for me. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. uh, do, do you get to any points where you feel like your own internal suffering is turned up and the own, you know, your internal heat in terms of suffering is turned up? Uh, or is it fairly easy to do at this point? Mm. Well, it's, uh, especially uh, at, the, at the end of the day, starting from, from uh, four or, or five uh, e the evening, uh, Personally, I, I, I start feeling these little headaches and uh, a little bit of pangs of hunger. Okay. But, uh, uh, but uh, personally, I don't have, uh, I, I can't stand it. I have no problem with it. Okay. Because I am, uh, uh, I, I'm already used to, 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 to fasting now and then. So uh, it's uh, for me, it's like a, a regular exercise that I go about uh, the whole year. Um, uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said that, you know, at moments when we catch ourselves suffering and we learn to suffer consciously. So you suddenly become aware of the headache or you become aware of a massive amount of thirst in your mouth or whatever. He recommended that we say some kind of an affirmation, may this suffering be for the development of my being or i wish that this suffering uh will help grow my being you know we can phrase it many different ways but to actually in that moment to become conscious of the fact that we are suffering and to make the wish that the suffering we are experiencing in that moment can be used to help grow our being and we can do this anywhere you know, if you've got to do some kind of physical chore and you're not used to doing physical chores, you know, let's say you've got to go out and mow the lawn for the first time in the year or whatever, and you feel a certain degree of suffering involved in that, a certain degree of, uh, you know, some, some kind of extra effort required and to make that wish. You know, I wish that the suffering will be for the growth of my being. Um, he phrased it a number of different ways, but uh, we can tap in and use that suffering. Um, do you do anything like that? Uh, no, not really. No. no, okay. I just, I just, I just stand it in the, I don't complain about it. I don't feel like, uh, 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 like uh, I complain about it or, or I, don't, I don't take it negatively. It's just, oh yeah, there is a headache and then okay. So it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if uh, if uh, if I if you understand. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm just also trying to get at the idea of suffering consciously. Um, suffering consciously is to be fully aware in this moment, here and now, 
that I'm suffering. You know, I've got a headache. A lot of times it's like, oh, I have a headache and it, you know, spurs a negative emotion and it spurs kind of a mechanical attempt to push the headache away. But to sit in the headache, to be aware, yeah, I have a headache. This is probably related to the lack of water and the fasting. And I am suffering. You know, I wish this suffering to be for my being, to, to suffer it consciously and at that moment of conscious suffering to turn it into a wish and to use the word wish. I wish this suffering will help grow my being. I, I don't have the exact phrase in front of me that, I mean, he gave a number of different phrases to his students over the years, but in that moment of the experiencing of the hardship, to rather than go, oh, I can't wait till seven, or oh, I'm not feeling so good, or my head, or or any kind of internal consideration, poor me, terrible me, to become much more objective in that moment, in the suffering, and to wish that the results of that suffering, to use it, and to start to harness the power of wish. Um, one of the powers, Mr. Gurdjieff says that we have, that we have no idea how to properly tap into the power of wish, learning how to grow our being through the process of wishing. Um, at any rate, um, it's uh, Sunday, April the 26th. Um, as I mentioned before, I wanna start changing what I'm doing. Uh, I've been doing, this is now meeting number 90 that I've been hosting for um, approximately two years now. Uh, so I've really delved and gone deep into certain aspects of the teachings, like the misuse of sexual energy, the importance of remorse of conscience, uh, fixing the machine, looking at the different states of energies, really delving into the theoretical aspects of the teachings. And I want to move on to a different phase. I'm still working it out in my mind. Um, I think I want to move away from meeting every week, maybe meeting every second week on the perhaps the first and third Sundays or something. I still haven't quite figured out the schedule. But Last week, I'm a, a bit clearer uh, than I was last week. I have these, I don't know how to talk about them, but knowings that I have to start changing things. And oftentimes I get these knowings without knowing what I have to change or what I have to do. And it doesn't really come to me all at once. I've got to kind of feel my way towards where I want to go. And um, compared to last week to this week, I have a clearer understanding, but I'm still haven't quite figured it all out yet. But I think the direction that I would like to go would be if I had to set up a series of exercises and a process of learning these teachings in conjunction with a series of exercises you know taking advantage of the fact that we live in this modern world that we have cameras on our phones that we have the ability to do things that we wouldn't mm -hmm. otherwise be able to do in other times um, for instance i can sit here right now and if i look at myself i can look at myself in real time i can see how I move my hands, I can see how I move my body. I have a greater ability to develop some kind of objective awareness about my physical self than say I would have if I had lived a hundred or a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago, perhaps the only place I might have seen my image would have been reflected in water. Or if I had been invited to some very rich person's home and they had a piece of metal that was shiny 
so you could see your reflection in it. A thousand years ago, most people didn't really have uh, any kind of real conception of what they looked like, of what other people saw. Now we can develop that more objective awareness. We see each other in the mirror or ourselves in the mirror every day, but it's a very limited profile view. Um, but for instance, we can get a friend, we can give them our phone, we could have them walk all the way around us and record us from front to side, to back to side, to front. We can also uh, have ourselves recorded sitting down, standing up, reaching for doors, walking upstairs. Um, we have a greater opportunity to get to know ourselves. We can record ourselves talking. We can play it back. We can see and hear how other people see and hear us and gain a greater degree of objectivity over ourselves. Now, this is just sort of a, a nebulous idea I'm still working on. But my goal is to go back to In Search of the Miraculous and the way that Mr. Gurji began to introduce the teachings. So the very first thing that is required is really self-study. Um, it's not so much self-observation, that's a bit of a higher order task. Self-study and anything that begins with the self with a dash beyond it in the Gurdjieff teachings is a form of mindful awareness. It's stepping up to world 24 and into the realm of personal consciousness. So self-study is just a preliminary step. It's to try and get an understanding of who we are. And as I said, we have tools that we didn't have even 20 years ago. Um, my daughter, can from half a mile away recognize me. I can't recognize her because my eyes, they're a little old. Um, she recognizes me by the way I move. I would never, if you showed me an image of myself half a mile away, walking towards where I was, maybe not half a mile, that's you know, probably 200 yards, walking towards where I was, I wouldn't recognize myself by looking at myself. I don't know how I move. I don't really have an understanding of the mechanics of the way I walk, the way I walk towards something or the way I walk away from something. I have no idea what I look like when I'm walking from the side. I know that when I've seen videos of myself and I've been you know, recorded from on the side, there was a little element of shock because that's not the myself that I'm really aware of. I'm aware of the myself, my face, directly in the mirror reflected back. I'm not aware of what I look like when I'm talking from behind, from the side, from different angles. So we have this ability, and I would like to try and get us to incorporate it, to try and bring self-study more into the modern world with the resources that we have. Now, any online profile, so to speak, I don't believe it can really capture our essence qualities, um, but there are certain online um, personality tests, so to speak. You know, there are values tests so you can figure out what your values are values are more important than beliefs there are also various other tests we can take like the myers-briggs um, personality test the you know um i the introvert extroversion intuitive uh thinking or thinking feeling breaking us down into quadrants and binary possibilities introvert extrovert um, there are other online personality tests that, uh, you know, for instance, there's the personality of the Enneagram. Um, those of us who are Gurdjieffian, we're a little bit iffy about the Enneagram or the application of the Enneagram in terms of personality. I actually think that the Enneagram of personality 
works based on the law of three. So people in their, you know, they're either dominant, you know, in terms of a negative expression of emotion, they're either anger dominant, fear dominant, or despair dominant. But because we're three brain beings, we could be anger, fearful, and despairing, or we could be angry, despairing, and fearful uh, using tests like the Enneagram of Personality can help us to focus more on some of the emotional dimensions of ourselves. There are also other personality tests, other psychological tests that are available online that we can use to give us a lot of information about not who we really are at the level of essence, but you know, our motivations, our interests, our, our you know, likes, dislikes. And by taking some of these tests, by doing some of these things, we can begin to look at, at ourself, but not just to look at ourself. For instance, in, I've talked about this before, in the Myers-Briggs, they come up with one of the binaries as introversion and extroversion. If you're an extrovert, your goal really should be to become more introverted. If you're introverted, your goal really should be to become more extroverted so you move to a point of balance and you develop your opposite qualities. So taking these tests will give us a kind of understanding of a certain aspect of our personality, but it'll give us just that understanding of a slice in time because if you took the same test 10 years later, things would be different because you would be 10 years older, 10 years more growth. But the goal is to, oops, there's Brian coming in. Um, okay, hopefully he's coming in. Um, the goal is to really begin to look at ourselves, to begin to study ourselves. Hi, Brian, um, you came in late. I'm talking about the fact that I want to move the direction of these meetings into um, just, it really has just come to me in the last day or two, and it's going to become clearer. I wish things came clear all at once for me, but I've got to sort of feel my way towards it. But I want to start doing, and probably not weekly, probably every second week, and getting a few more people who can talk about their inner work and inner experiences. But I want to go back to In Search of the Miraculous, the way that Mr. Gurdjieff began to introduce the teachings and the process to Uspensky. So the self-study, um, we, we have these incredible tools available for self-study that we didn't have before. And to understand that the, the goal of self-study is to really begin to assess our human machine to look at ourselves, to see the different ways we're leaking energy, the different ways that our machine is dirty and that it needs to be clean, but to also anchor um, not only this practical approach, but the theoretical understanding. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'll do this, but it won't be right away. But, you know, the difference between personality and essence. Um, can we begin to get an understanding of what's essential of our essence, of the qualities of our essence? Can we begin to differentiate our personality? I believe we can, particularly if we understand what these concepts are. Um, then, you know, to look and to really start to try to do some practical exercises, for instance, that are connected with the state of identification and a more objective awareness. So to begin to figure out the ways that we internally consider and then to begin to practice exercises in external consideration. So I'm gonna pull in a lot of the exercises that were given by Mr. Gurdjieff um, as I said, I've got the Joseph Aziz book. 
Uh, it doesn't cover nearly the range of inner exercises that it really should. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff, um, in uh, particularly the transcripts of the Paris meetings, gave hundreds of little snippets of possible inner exercises that people can do. And uh, those aren't in that book. They're not in any of the other books. So I want to kind of create a program, uh, a, a series that we can, or that I can put up on YouTube and people can go to program one and begin to the basis of self-study. And as they move through it, move towards the basis of self-observation. As they move through it, begin to encounter some of the ideas, the, the nature of negative emotions, the nature of identification, the nature of internal considering, the, the juxtaposed with external considering, the different ways that we leak energy, perhaps through excessive movements or the ruminations of our mind. And you know, the fact that we lack unity, the, the, that we lack will, um, there are certain exercises and ways that we can prove to ourselves that we lack unity, uh, that we lack will. Once we realize it as a, rather than a theoretical concept, as we, when we realize it as something real within ourselves, we begin to change in terms of our connection with it. So as well as doing the inner work, focusing on the sitting, focusing on the various different forms of inner exercises that have been given in the tradition. Um, I have to admit that I really like what uh, Joseph Aziz is doing. He is saying that, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff told people to keep exercises limited within their mind and not to write them down and to share them verbally. But as Joseph Aziz with his research has done and shown that as people die, those exercises get lost. So he's trying to, he's focused on trying to go and uncover some of the authentic Gurdjieffian exercises, particularly as taught by his teacher, Joseph, uh, um, George Addy, George and uh, um, I forget uh, his wife's name, but the two of them, they were both students of Mr. Gurdjieff. He's gone around trying to collect some of the other exercises from other students. Some are forthcoming, some are not giving it to him. But there's a whole different dimension. How do we work, for instance, with concepts like identification? How do we work with concepts such as negative emotions? Uh, we can talk about the suppression of the expression of negative emotions. What does that mean? That's only the preliminary step. Mr. Gurdjieff said that that's just where you start. The only place you can start in terms of negative emotions is the non-expression of them. But, you know, my negative emotions will be different than Hisham's negative emotions, which will be different than Brian's negative emotions. Um, the way I get upset will be unique to me. It'll be like a fingerprint. And so this is also why Mr. Gurdjieff said that, you know, there are no, there are general exercises, you know, sitting there aware of your body, aware of your breathing, getting a sense of self is a general exercise but where we each are leaking energy will be different. Now, it's not completely different. Mr. Gurdjieff did say that there were 28 different personality types. Um, I assume, I mean, it's a division of three. Uh, it's connected to nine. I'm also assuming that there is a vast difference between our personality type and potentially our essence type and you know what is my essence type i don't know i've never come across anyone really trying to delve into what our essence type is as opposed to our personality type but our personality type our personality is actually related to the secretary in the office which is a metaphor for the formatory thinking. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said personality is a, a, a byproduct or attribute of formatory thinking. Um, so when we look at formatory thinking, when we look at the office 
is supposed to be the formatory apparatus and the secretary or the assistant is our education. Um, there's a case for being made that that secretary or that assistant really is an expression of our personality and the way we have learned to react to certain situations. It's a very mechanical part of ourselves. How can we begin to observe this mechanical part of ourselves? We have to learn to do it. We have to learn to begin to see the various roles that we can play. Perhaps there's a role we play at work. Perhaps there's a role we play at work when we are with one of our bosses and another role we play at work when we are with our colleagues. Um, perhaps there's a role that we play when we're with our family. Um, to begin to look at these roles, to begin to try and delve deeper into ourselves. So, you know, I want to try and deconstruct the process that not only was Uspensky introduced to the teachings, we've also got another book available. Um, the other book is... Um, um, Anna Butowski's uh, with Mr. Gurdjieff in St. Petersburg and Paris. I might be misquoting the title. Um, Anna Butowski had a PhD in music. She was a concert level pianist. Um, Uspensky had some kind of weird relationships with women. Um, he loved being around women, but he didn't touch them. He didn't move it to that next level of intimacy. And he and Anna Butowski were, you know, what my mother would have called bosom buddies. Um, they weren't lovers. They were not a couple, but they had a very intense relationship. And Uspensky met Mr. Gurdjieff. And immediately upon meeting Mr. Gurdjieff, you don't see this in In Search of the Miraculous. He said to Anna Butowski, you've got to come and meet this man. And so uh, Anna Butowski gives us a, uh, a, another understanding of those original meetings that P.D. Uspensky attended in St. Petersburg with Mr. Gurdjieff. At times, it almost seems like it was Mr. Gurdjieff with Uspensky, but Anna Potowski was there, Dr. Sternoble was there, an architect was there. There were some uh, about six of them who were at those original meetings, and Anna Potowski wrote her own book. I'm not sure of the mechanics of the book, but uh, you know, there's a book with her name on it uh, recounting the, you know, not only from there, but also up to moving to Paris. So it converged because she ultimately became a dedicated student of Mr. Gurdjieff's. And when Uspensky went to England, she stayed in Paris with Mr. Gurdjieff. So we've got all these other um, source materials of looking at those meetings, looking at the way Mr. Gurdjieff challenged them what he tried to get them to do, how he tried to get them to observe themselves, how he tried to get them to engage in the process of self-study, how he tried to get them to realize that as they were, they had no will, no ability to really do, and no consistency or unity within themselves. So to get people to realize that they're living in their personality and their personality is a very mechanical part of our being. And here, this brings up another problem. Um, a machine is incapable of observing itself. By definition, a, a machine is incapable of self-awareness true self-awareness. So there were other analogies. Mr. Gurdjieff talked about people going to die like a dog. Um, 
same analogy as a machine. A dog lacks that ability to be aware of itself here and now in this moment. The ability to bring that mindful attention to the body, that mindful attention to the self. Um, so how do we study our machine-like behavior? Well, we can begin to record ourselves, see how we talk, see how we move. What is it like if you were looking at yourself from the side as you were talking slightly back? You would get a different perception and a different image of yourself. And in these days, you know, with we've got, you know, super cameras where we can record ourselves, we can take pictures, we can give our cameras to friends. We can say, I want you to record me walking upstairs, walking downstairs to try and walk as naturally as we can to notice which foot we lead with to notice various different things, how we stand up, how we sit down, various, very automatic physical behaviors. And it's a lot of those mechanical habits that we want to begin to break, to begin to stop doing. So if you step up with your right foot, to step up with your left. If you reach with your right hand to open doors always, to begin reaching with your left. If you put your pants on with your left foot first, do it with your right to try and start to do some of those things so that we move differently. Um, for instance, uh, I think Mr. Gurdjieff once recommended, you know, someone said, well, what happens if I put a stone in my shoe? That would be a great idea. My son did that for a couple of months. This was back when he was 17. He would put something in his shoe that forced him to walk with a different gait. So he wasn't walking like he would normally walk. And then he took the pebble out of his shoe and began to consciously change the way he walked. So every time he would walk, he would try and do something differently. Um, try to, to move something. And it's in this gap that we can begin to observe ourselves. Um, a machine is incapable of observing itself. Once you begin observing yourself, you've stepped up into world 24. You are no longer the machine in world 48. So once you begin to observe yourself, you become the observer, observing, for instance, your body moving. And through that process, you may also mess up what you're observing. So it becomes a bit more difficult. But if you have a recording of yourself walking towards someone and you can see the way you walk, you get that imprinted in your mind, you begin to experiment with it inside and then you maybe step half a foot longer or shorter or you move your arms in a slightly different way. These are all different ways we can break free from the machine self. But it also requires us observing the machine self. And the moment we observe the machine self, we are no longer in the machine self. We've stepped up to that other state. We're no longer a machine. We're no longer a dog. So the moment we become personally conscious, the moment we become aware of our body, we actually change. So how do we learn to observe ourselves in the mechanical state? Um, we can do it, as I said earlier, we've got this ability with modern technology. Um, I'm a hypnotherapist. I've done a lot of voice recordings. I know my voice really, really well. If I hear it, for a lot of people, they don't get a lot of an opportunity to record their voice. And when they hear their voice, it's like, that's not my voice. But what they record is what other people hear. When, when I'm speaking, it's causing things to vibrate through the bones in my head and everything. And so I'm hearing different than what other people are hearing. But we can record that. If we can record ourselves 
telling a story without letting the recording interfere with our story. If we could just record ourselves in what they call natural speech patterns, perhaps, you know, for myself, one of the things I don't like about my speech patterns, but I understand where it comes from is uh, the use of ah, uh, the use of all. Um, when I hear myself, I become aware of, and these are partially conversational fillers, and they're partially a product of the way my mind processes language. So right now, here in this moment, I'm not speaking naturally. I'm aware that I'm being recorded. I'm speaking probably in this moment in more complex, more proper uh, speech patterns. And there I just threw in an ah. And so, you know, through a professional recording, what I'm doing online, it would be nice to just speak with this coherent flow, without all of the pauses, without the movements, without the way that I move my hands, but to also capture that, to capture me in natural speech conversations where I forget there's a camera and I'm talking to someone and I would become aware of all these, what we call ticks, but they're not really ticks. The way I say, ah, um, uh, the, the way I can hesitate, I can also st stutter a little bit and just, just, you know, get a little handle on the words that I'm saying, but normally I don't see this. I don't see myself as, a, as other people see me. I don't hear myself as other people hear me, but I have this ability to record myself. Um, I know that when I talk to people on phones, I'm far less mindful. Uh, I'm partially visualizing the person I'm talking to. It's much more difficult for me to be present in the moment when I'm talking on a phone. If I do a Zoom conversation, I can be much more present in the moment. But when I'm talking on a phone, I can get lost. And I don't really like talking on the phone for that reason, but to record myself in a conversation that I have on the phone and to let myself get into the emotion of the conversation, to allow myself to go into a greater state of sleep or waking sleep in the conversation, and then listening to the recording of myself will give me an understanding, a more objective perspective of myself to see myself talking say from this angle so if i'm talking right now i never really see myself talking from this angle i'm either talking into a mirror or i'm talking into a camera but you know and i also move my hands when i'm talking when i'm you know on zoom and whatever my hands are kind of lower so you can't see the movements that my hands are doing, and apparently this is good for recordings. You don't wanna move hands as much as I do. I'm very graphic in terms of the movement of my hands. So there are many different ways we can begin to work with these teachings, um, to begin to observe your head brain, as opposed to your feeling brain, as opposed to your physical brain. The physical brain deals with uh, awareness, perhaps, of hot, cold uh, colors, the color blue, the color green. These are instinctual awarenesses. Um, it's just pure, raw observation. Feeling brain, it likes to feel its way towards things. Do I feel like doing this or do I feel like doing that. The head brain's involved in compare and contrast. So compare this red apple with this green apple. Well, the uh, red apple is red and it's slightly juicier in the green apple. Well, it's green and it's got a little slightly more bitter taste. And I can create a list of comparisons to compare and contrast qualities of an apple. So to begin to slot 
what's going on in our mind? Is it a head brain comparing and contrasting? Is it a feeling brain? So do I feel like or don't feel like? So it's related to our likes and dislikes. And then the body brain, um, trying to differentiate between these, trying to figure out ways that work so that there also, there's also going to be an experimental quality to this. Um, some things will work really well. Some things won't work at all. And this is also, I, I want to boost the group up to get maybe six or seven or maybe eight people and to focus purely on the discussion, on our own experiences with the various inner exercises. So, as I said, you know, every second or two Sundays of the month, maybe the first and uh, third or the second and fourth. And my goal will be to record the inner exercise, to perhaps go through the theoretical understanding, what I'm hoping to achieve, uh, describing the nature of the exercise, recording it, putting it up on YouTube, sharing it with the members of the group who will then go and try this exercise and make notes. And then when we get together, the actual meeting will involve the discussion of our own personal experiences with the exercise, where it worked, where it didn't work, where we could improve it, where we could change it, um, what our observations are, uh, so that people who then watch that meeting can get a greater depth and understanding of the different things involved with doing this inner work, with this way to understand ourselves. So um, I've kind of messed up the, the normal order. Um, I was gonna do an inner exercise first and then go into this explanation. And I went into this explanation first um, and we'll do an inner exercise right now. It's always good to begin an inner exercise with some kind of an affirmation, some kind of an awareness of what we do. I'm partial to um, this, to recognize that I work for myself. I work for mankind, for humanity. I work for the earth herself. Now, I have a physical body. My physical body are made up of the elements that come from this planet. They came from this planet. I'm continually feeding on the elements of this planet. It's making up my body. And at death, these elements, these molecules will return to the earth. Mr. Gurdjieff says, do not be identified with your physical body because it does not belong to you. It belongs to great nature. He also said, we have an essence. We have the self at this level of world 24. Most of our essences are at the age of a child. We haven't learned to grow them. We haven't learned to develop them. But he said, our essence is human essence. I like to use the metaphor of a glass of water. And the glass of water is the ocean of human essence. and a single drop out of that then is our essence here now in this lifetime. And then when we die, just like the molecules of our body return to the earth, that drop returns back to the ocean of human essence. Unless we have begun to develop our own individuality, unless we have begun to coalesce an inner self within us, begun to grow, ourselves at the level of the Kesjian body, at the astral level, in the realm of world 48. And then we can start to become more real. But even then, the essence isn't my essence. It belongs to humanity. So 
I'm not only doing this work for the earth through the fact that I inhabit an earthen body and what I do to my body affects the earth, perhaps in a very insignificant minor way, but by working on the physical dimensions of my body, these elements in my body will eventually return to earth. And I am doing something to help the earth through doing this inner work. The same with my essence. By working on my essence, particularly on exercises uh, developed and connected with the development of the essence, the cleaning of our essence, this is more of ourself on a deep emotional level, more of our emotional being. But there are proper ways to grow our essence, to grow ourself at this level, to engage in inner work in the proper form and sequence. So whenever we do inner work, we are working on that level. And then we're also working for ourselves. Uh, J.G. Bennett said that, you know, within any inner exercise, one third of the energy was taken up by doing the exercise itself. One third of it was given back to us and one third of it went in service of who knows what. Um, now I disagree slightly with the proportions, but the idea, the sentiment behind it is, you know, we're not only doing this for ourselves, but we're doing this for great nature, for life itself, perhaps even for the universe. So this recognition that whenever we do inner work, this is a sacred task. We are not just doing this to change ourselves. We are doing this for humanity and for the earth herself. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff also said that there was the potential to abuse inner exercises. He said, um, he told his students, I'm gonna teach you an inner exercise, but do not write it down. Do not make it widely available. Um, he would give them permission at times to share the exercise or not. And as a result, we're losing a lot of the exercises as people are dying off. But he said that there was a potentially destructive element uh, to this. Joseph Aziz, um, he came up with the theory that, you know, if we transform ourselves at the level of essence and grow a Kesjian body, but we haven't overcome our negative emotions, that this aspect is what's going to have the real problem and it's the danger. And I think that's a minor dimension, but I think he certainly has a point there. Um, as we develop a Kesjian body, as we grow our self in world 24. As we lift the center of gravity of our psychic life up from the mechanical realm of world 48 up into realm 12, that realm of essence, we can grow another body. And we have to grow this other body in the proper form and sequence, something that is discussed in detail in Beelzebub's Tales but it's really the proper form and sequence in which to engage in self-remembering. When we self-remember in the proper form and sequence, we begin to grow the structure within ourselves that will become our Kesjian body. And then from that Kesjian body, we will be able to grow the higher being body, but it's like a building. You know, you need a stable base and then you can build another floor, but you've got to build it with the right materials and in the right way. And then from that, you can build another floor on top of it. And this is in part the process of the human journey. But Mr. Gurdjieff also said that our hand bladzuin, uh, when another word that he coined, hand bladzuin is the blood of the Kesjian body. If I cut my hand, we will see the blood of my physical body. The Kesjian body is the blood of my, or the uh, Habhen Bladzwin is the blood of my Kesjian body. If I develop a Kesjian body, and if I don't do it 
properly with the proper constraints. I believe that it can give me powers that a normal person doesn't quite have the maturity to handle. And by this, what I mean is Mr. Gurdjieff said that the blood of the Kestian body has a very hypnotic quality. So people who develop a Kestian body become unnaturally persuasive. They have an ability to speak to people's subconscious minds. They have an ability to mesmerize people. And I believe that Joseph Aziz is wrong. I believe that this is where the problems can arise. Uh, fortunately, I've been a professional hypnotherapist for the last 30 years. So I'm very well acquainted with the power of suggestion, the ways of making suggestions, various different abilities. And I can see how this can be problematic if a person develops this level and they just want to use it for sales or control or whatever. But it's already happening. People are already figuring out the power of suggestion. Salespeople are already putting their clients into a more receptive and suggestive state. It's happening all over. It's one of the problems with our world that certain people have learned how to develop these abilities, and then they use them in service of their ego and for the gratification of their ego. And therefore, this vow that Mr. Gurdjieff gave to one of his French students in Paris during the Second World War is a wonderful vow because we're not just making a vow, stating a vow, we are also speaking this to our sub conscious mind. We are turning it into a wish. We are turning it into a vow that hopefully the more we repeat this, the more our essence, the more that deeper part of ourself, the more our subconscious understands that we are engaging in this process, not for what it will get me not because it will make me a better salesperson, not because of anything it will give me, but there will be profit from it. It will be for what I can help other people do. So I'm a hypnotherapist. I use the power of suggestion. I use the power of Haddon Bladzwin to suggest good things to my clients, to lead them in good direction, to help them positively. So this prayer, this vow, this statement, this affirmation can also guide each and every one of us so that when we say it, we're not just saying it, but our subconscious mind is paying attention. It's learning this and it's like putting in a suggestion at the subconscious level to use what arises from this process in a good way. Um, I have clients, male clients, they come to see me. They phone me up and they say they're suffering from anxiety. Then they come to see me and they say that they're suffering not anxiety, but social anxiety. And at least in 50%, maybe higher number of the cases, I say, you're not really suffering from anxiety. You're not really suffering from social anxiety. You're really just incredibly lonely and you would like to find a girlfriend. And that's where they're coming from. They just don't know how to properly talk to women. They don't know how to properly interact. And so through the sessions that I do with hypnosis and coaching and counseling, I give them very detailed pointers. I go back into the subconscious mind, try to figure out where the blockages are and whatever. But I always add the suggestion that as soon as you find your perfect woman, as soon as you find someone you want to spend the rest of your life with, 
these skills will just kind of dissolve and maybe seep into other areas of your life. Um, and I give this post-hypnotic suggestion over and over and over again through the three, four, five sessions that I deal with these individuals so that they don't get crazy and they don't suddenly, they have an argument with their girlfriend and then they go and they start talking to another woman or whatever. I want to shut that down. I want it to only be so that they can use it to enhance their life. So saying this wish, repeating this vow is actually a way of giving ourselves through auto-suggestion, through self-suggestion, through self-hypnosis, speaking to the deeper inner part of ourselves so that we do not abuse what comes after. If you learn to externally consider, to pay real attention to other people, you will realize how you can manipulate them with your communication, with your words. If you manipulate them to become more aware, to become more responsible, to grow as a human being, to be a better person, that's okay. But if you manipulate them because you want to get a sale, or you want to get a student, or you want to do something for your own egotistical and egocentric ends, it's not really okay. So this prayer, I wish to be, I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be. And realize here, these statements that you're making and through the act of repetition, we call it compounding uh, in hypnosis, the law of compounding. When you say something like this, I wish to be, I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be, you are affirming this potential within yourself. And by affirming this potential, you are making it more likely. Uh, if all you did was accept what Uspensky wrote, that we're broken machines, how can a broken machine wish to be? How can a broken machine can be, or have the right to be, or have the ability to be? This is a profound act of auto-suggestion. It's a profound subconscious process. We are instructing our subconscious. It understands what we're trying to do. So in this first part, I wish to be, I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be. This is actually saying you're not quite as broken and dog-like and going to die like a dog and machine-like and going to die and perish like a dog in a machine as you might otherwise be led to believe if you've just become acquainted with these teachings. This is telling us, it's affirming at the deep subconscious level that I have the ability to be, I can be, I have the right to be, all of that. And then we limit this. We give ourselves the suggestion, I swear to myself, this is not an oath we're making to God. This is not an oath we're making to other people. This is an oath we are making to ourself, to our deeper self, to that subconscious self. I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. So we are imbuing all of this inner work all of this ascension, this growth of our being, this, this change within ourselves, all of these, that we're not doing this so that we become powerful, so that we become influential, so that we can you know, convince people to do various things. These will actually happen. 
but we're going to develop powers and we have to learn to develop them responsibly to help others not for my personal profit but to help others this is a vow we make to our subconscious self this is an inward vow and then i wish to be to help others here we make mr gurdjieff makes a very very clear connection so i wish to be and because i wish to be i can be and because i can be i have the right to be and because i have the right to be i have the ability to be but it all starts with the wish so collapsing it i wish to be to help others so um let me um so we can you know i wish to be the very beginning to help others and then we have those the beginning and the end encapsulated i wish to be to help others and so in this is implicit all the rest of this is in this little bit i wish to be to help others um a very profound corrective uh this is to be understood as a vow now, Mr. Gurdjieff said that personality, you cannot expect our personality, the self at the level of world 48, to make any kind of real promise or real commitment. The self, that persona that makes the commitment then shifts and another persona comes in and other personas, different multiplicity of eyes, different aspects of our self. Vows can only be made at the level of essence. They can only be made at a more inward level. My personality, at the highest, my personality can say, I promise I will try to do that. That's all we can promise at the level of personality. At the level of essence, we can begin to make these deeper vows we can begin to make a more substantial and more serious promise um mr gurdjieff made a distinction between the promises we make at the level of personality and essence vows and he said you know a personality promise but an essence vow if you make an essence vow if you make it with this deep holy intoned awareness the consequences of breaking it then become much greater so this is to be understood as a vow so this is a much deeper higher form of promise where we are doing this work to help others. So let's just then become aware of our body. The most important awareness we can develop is the awareness of our physical body as one organic whole. Mr. Gurdjieff went through this over and over and over. And he actually began to introduce much more elaborate exercises in the last 10 years of his life than he did before. And it's been theorized that the reason he did this was because he realized he wasn't getting through to people that the effort he put on teaching people how to do this in russia the effort he took on teaching people how to do this at the priere didn't work because he didn't set it up as an elaborate moving through the body point by point inner exercise he just at those periods tried to put people into situations 
where they develop this sense of self and told them to become aware of that and to just hold on to that. But for a lot of people, it was a little too difficult. And so then he began to create exercises that took people through the body, that helped people build up this process. So someone who has never had an awareness of their physical body as one organic whole, who's never consciously summoned this experience, he then developed various exercises for them. And so let's become aware. And this comes through George Abbey, one of Mr. Gurdjieff's students, and his wife. Um, I forget his wife's name, but they were really a team. They were both students of Mr. Gurdjieff. Um, George Addy was a top level architect and his wife was a concert level pianist. And um, so it came from both of them. But just become aware of your right shoulder. Then become aware of your right upper arm. Try to become aware of say the back of your right arm, the front of your right arm, the muscles, then move down to your elbow. Become aware of your elbow. Become aware of the bones in your elbow and then become aware of this side. Become aware of the inner part. Then move down to your lower arms. Try to become aware of the multitude of muscles in your lower arm. Then try to become aware of your wrist. Become aware of the top of your wrist, the part on the bottom. Become aware of the bones in your wrist. And then move into your hands. And become aware of your palms. Become aware of the top of your hands. Become aware of the balls of your, on the pads of all your fingers and thumbs. Perhaps even the tips. Perhaps even becoming aware of all of the nails. Let's do this individually. Let's go to the right thumb. Become aware of all three bones in the right thumb. Try to become aware of the pressure sensors underneath the, the right thumb, on the, the pad, the ball of the right thumb. Try to become aware of the tip of the right thumb. Try to become aware of the nail. Try to become aware of the skin on top of your right thumb and then move and do this for your right index finger. Try to become aware of the bones involved in your right index finger, the pads underneath your right index finger. Try to become aware of the sensation of the ball of the main part just under your right index finger, the tip, the nails, the skin on top. Try to do this with your middle finger. Aware of the underneath, those pressure sensitive points, the skin, aware of the tip, the nail, the skin above. And then try to move over to your fourth finger and do this with your fourth finger. And then do this with your baby finger. Really try to develop this sensation of your hand. This is actually important for much later exercises for feeling influences. We bring influences into the body and out of the body through our hands and our feet. So this awareness of the hands and fingers is an extremely important awareness, especially for later on. And then just try to become aware of the sensation of your whole right arm right from your shoulder down to the tips of your fingers, the top, the bottom, perhaps the sensation, the touch of clothing, the touch of air. Maybe you can even feel, you know, hair on your fingers, the top of your fingers, your nails. Really try to become aware with the, as deeply as possible the awareness of your right arm. And then Try to hold on to this awareness, just an awareness of your entire right arm, trying to be aware of your right arm as one organic whole, but as many different parts of it as the, sa the same time. 
try to become aware of all of it, the sensation of clothing, your fingers, the air, your nails, the tips of your fingers, those pads underneath the tips of your fingers, the various different things. Hold on to this awareness and then become aware of your right hip. Become aware of your right thigh, the top of your right thigh, the bottom, your hamstring. Then move into your knees, become aware of the bend behind your kneecap, behind the bones in your knee. Move down into your shins, uh, your lower legs, become aware of your shins and your calves, the muscles in your calves, the bones in your shins. Move down to your ankle bones, then down into your feet. Become aware of the top and the bottom of your feet. Become aware of the bones in your feet. Become aware of the soles of your feet, your instep. Become aware of your toes. Become aware of that pad on the bottom of your big toe, the tip of your big toe, the nail of your big toe, the skin on top of your big toe. Try to become aware of this in your second toe, the pad, the tip, the nails, the skin on top, the third toe, the fourth toe, the fifth toe. Try to become aware of your whole feet, the top and bottom, the skins, the toes, your nails, the bones in your feet. Try to become aware of your whole right leg while also remaining aware of your right arm and while remaining aware of both of these. Try to become aware of your left hip, your left thigh, the top of your left upper leg, your left hamstrings, your left knee, the bend behind your left knee, your left shin, the bones in your shin, your left calf, the muscles in your calves, moving down to your ankles, the bones in your ankles, moving down into your feet, aware of your feet, your heels, your toes, the top and bottom of your feet, the bones in your feet, the pads underneath all of the toes in your feet. Become aware of your big toe, the, 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 the nail of your big toe, the top of your big toe, the pad underneath your big toe, the top of your big toe, the skin. Try to become aware of your second toe, all of those points, your third toe, your fourth toe, your fifth toe. Try to become aware of your left leg, all of these points, of your left leg. Try to be aware of your left leg as one organic whole, but within this organic whole, you're aware of your feet, the pads of your toes, the tip of your toes, your nails, the top of your toes, your feet. And try to develop now this whole sensation of your left leg, while also aware of your right leg, or your right arm and your right leg, the the pads underneath your right fingers, your right fingernails, your right fingers, your arm, your right leg, your right toes, your left leg. Try to be develop as complex an awareness of your right arm, right leg, left leg as possible. And then also divide a portion of your attention to become aware of your left shoulder, your left upper arm, your left elbow and the bend behind your left elbow, the muscles in your lower arm, the top and bottom of your lower arms, your left wrist, uh, your left hands, the top and bottom of your left hands, your left thumb, the nail, the tip, the ball of your thumbs, the bones in your thumbs, moving to your right or your left index finger, the nail, the tips, the touch of the balls, the bones, your middle finger, your fourth finger, your baby finger. Try to really sense your left hand with all of the bones, with all of the balls, with all of the nails and the tips of all of the fingers at once. Try to sense your whole left arm at once. Try to sense your right arm, right leg, left leg and left arm. Really go deep into the sensation of these parts of your body. And then we're gonna do this slightly differently. Become aware of your reproductive organs and your buttocks. To become aware of that whole area front to back while also remaining aware of your four limbs. And then allow your awareness to move up your spine. I'm not gonna do it vertebrae by vertebrae, but slowly, 
start in the sacral region uh, where your vertebrae, your spine is below your pelvis. Move it up into the lumbar region of your lower back, the thoracic region of your middle, and then the thoracic part of your upper back right up to your neck and then move your awareness into your cervical vertebrae. And then remain aware of all four limbs, your, from your reproductive organs to your buttocks, up your spine, and then slowly allow awareness to seep up into your navel. Try to become maybe even aware of the right side of your navel, beyond your navel, the left side. Allow your awareness to then kind of come up through your duodenum, through your stomach, into your solar plexus, up into perhaps you can be aware of your liver and gallbladder, half underneath uh, the right side of your chest, uh, half underneath the ribs, half exposed. Towards the center, we have the spleen half underneath the ribs, half exposed, and towards the left side, we have our pancreas, again, half under the ribs, half exposed. Then bring your awareness up into your lungs, become aware of your lungs inflating and deflating, and then bring your awareness into your heart. Perhaps you can even pay attention to the beating of your heart. And then from your heart up to your thymus, then into your throat. Become aware of the inside of your throat. Become aware of the back of your mouth. Become aware of your mouth, your tongue, the roof of your mouth, how your teeth are embedded in the upper bone and uh, teeth are embedded in the jawbone. Become aware of your jawbone. Become aware of your facial bone. Moving up into your skull, become aware of the frontal bone just behind your forehead, the temporal bones in the side of your head, the parietal mm -hmm. bone in the top of your head, the occipital bone in the back of your head. Try to become aware of your head and try to put this all together. Try to become aware of your whole physical body. Try to become aware of your physical embodiment. And as you do, Recognize as well that you have more sensory nerve nodes in your hands and fingers, your feet and toes than anywhere else in your body. You have twice the number per centimeter of sensory nerve nodes in the skin of your hands than you do in the skin of your lower back. So try to become aware of your entire body. Try to sense your entire body at once. Really, also, as you sense your entire body, try to sense at a greater detail, at a deeper level of depth and perception of your hands and your feet. Try to sense your whole body, but really aware of your hands and feet, aware of your whole body, aware of your hands and feet, your legs and arms, your torso, your throat, your neck, your head. Try to develop this comprehensive hence awareness of your body. And then just allow that to rest. And doing this exercise will have brought you into the collected state. So collect your atmosphere, collect the energy around your body, bring it back close to you, collect your aura, whatever you want to call it, your atmosphere maybe a meter, meter and a half, keep it calm, keep it tranquil. What we've just gone through in terms of self-sensing and awareness of the body is also partially contained within your atmosphere. And in a moment, I'm gonna to count to three. And when I get to three, I would like you to breathe your atmosphere in. And then imagine that something remains to settle within you as you breathe out. Collecting your atmosphere, keeping it calm, tranquil, still. One, two, three. Breathe it in, and as you breathe out, imagine that something remains from this exercise that will go to help grow your inner being. And then silently in your mind, repeat after me. May results from this exercise be transubstantiated within me 
for my being. And then just slowly come back. Um, I realize I've done everything in reverse today, but um, I will be putting on Facebook when I will be starting the, uh, the new meetings. I'm gonna take a little bit of time to go through in search of the miraculous, to think about how I'm going to do this. And as I said, I will be posting the, uh, the exercises as standalone exercises and recruiting a few more people. And then when we get together every couple of weeks, again on a Sunday, roughly the same time, um, to actually spend the time discussing the exercise, going through the exercise. Um, I've discussed today's exercise at a higher level. I've discussed the vow at a different, in a different way. Similar things like this, this will be how I will present certain exercises with a much deeper explanation of them. And then to go and have people go out and try these to whatever, you know, whether or not it's a personality test or filming ourselves or doing something to go out and try these and then to be willing to share your experiences with us in this forum so that then these can be posted to YouTube. It really helps to listen to someone else's experience of an inner exercise. It shows us that we can say, look for this, and maybe we've been focusing too much on that and various different things. This ability, it's one of the, 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 the good parts, you know, one of the better things that happens when you actually have a live group, the ability to share our experiences so that we can grow from other people's descriptions. Um, at any rate, um, I didn't have any notes or anything today, so um, I just wanted to try and clarify, not just for myself, but for everyone else, what I'm gonna be trying to do. But we are now out of time. Um, so I'm gonna take a little brief break from doing this. And then I'm going to start posting exercises online. And the one I want to start with is what they call the preparatory exercise as found in Beelzebub Tales. Um, when Hussein, Hussein, Hussein um, suddenly realizes that the world wasn't created, that it had to have been created and there were processes. And Mr. Gurdjieff told him, you're a little too young now but I want you during sunrise to make a wish that your conscious and subconscious parts harmonize. There's another rendition of that in an earlier version of Beelzebub Tales where he doesn't recommend doing it at dawn. Um, it's something we should all start thinking about. And that's probably where I'll begin. So I'm just giving you a teaser of what to expect next. But at any rate, it's noon. Um, you came in a little late, Brian, so I wasn't able to ask you how things were going and we're out of time now and we talked with Hisham, but this is the direction that I wanna move this in. So, and it's all volunteer again. Um, you know, if this is not what you signed up for, don't worry about that. Um, you can just continue with your own work or whatever. This is, it's just a new phase of <clears throat> feeling like I've got to really start figuring out how we can apply these teachings in our daily life on a regular basis and to systematize this through a series of YouTube recordings so that people can come a year, 10 years, start working on themselves, start to practically apply some of these ideas. At any rate, it's now three minutes past 12. Um, thank you guys. <laughs> for listening, for being here, listening to me talking today. So we're gonna be, it's gonna become much more experimental, much more experiential. Um, so for those of you watching on Facebook, thank you. For those who are watching on YouTube later, thank you. Um, bye for now. Bye.